Actually, we're going to start with Karen. Um, okay. Besides being a parent for the last 20 years, before that I had a career as well um, and went to graduate school at night where Deborah was my professor and then I TA'd her class. And what I found when I was working in the schools was that the students were much more programmed, structured, had very fast-paced lives, much more so than when I went to school. And what that brought about was that they didn't have as much time to contemplate and reflect their lives. And um, that coupled with the fact that their parents often were in two income families and uh, they were also very busy. Um, the kids weren't sitting down as much for dinner with the parents and talking through things. So th what happened um, that I found as, as a teacher was that students were coming much more to teachers to ask for advice and to talk. And even though I was, as a role of counselor, I was also a 10th grade homeroom teacher. And I was amazed how, first of all, how many students came to me to discuss issues, and also how complex and difficult the issues were that these students were discussing with me. And I found IPR for me um, just helped me when I was one on one with a student just to slow things down and help me to help them figure out a solution that was best for them in their lives and not just give them the quick fix solution that they might have been initially looking for. It also helped because I felt that it was not my place to be giving advice to these students uh, because I didn't know what kinds of morals were um, the background that they were coming from in their families. So I felt that IPR um, is great for any kind of a teacher role, um, a teacher who's going to be advising uh, students, which most of them are. Um, and it's a way for teachers to um, have, uh, and, and advisors, um, to give the students tools instead of answers uh, and equip them then for the future for them to be able to come up with solutions for their own lives in the future. Hi, I'm Marcy Mann, and oh, as it says right there, and I, first of all, I want to say how really pleased I was to reconnect with my former classmate and my former professor in order to do this session. Really quite t tickled pink. Um, and I've spent my career in independent schools, originally as a Spanish teacher and advisor, like Caroline was, and then I've spent the majority of my career as a school administrator. And whereas I initially was using the method that we're going to demonstrate today and explain today with students in a similar capacity that Caroline just described, I went on to use it extensively um, when uh, counseling and gui giving guidance to parents because I became a school administrator and I, more often than students, I had parents in my office then that I was advising and coaching as well. And then gradually my career evolved so that I found that I was using the same method with faculty members and still do all the time. So all three constituencies in the school, the students, the, the uh, parents, and the faculty members uh, were, um, I found, it wanted to be heard, wanted to be, have things discussed, and wanted um, a kind of conversation where I wasn't solving their problems for them, but helping them to find a solution themselves. And that's what this method helped me to be able to do. In fact, when we returned together, the three of us, to talk about it, I, and I started to re-examine how I use it, I realized it is such a natural and ordinary and regular part of my professional repertoire that dissecting it for myself again to prepare for today seemed almost awkward and unusual to me. Last but not least, because it's become such a natural part of my repertoire, I would say that um, I even, without knowing it, use this method when talking to friends in, in, in just collegial situations and friendly situations to help them to understand the root of what they're asking me about. It come, any friend comes to me with a situation, and I find myself falling into the very modes you're going to learn about today. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm also happy to be here. It, I must say that it was um, with mixed feelings that I realized that Carolyn and Marcy were students of mine 25 years ago, yeah. maybe even more than 25 years ago. I don't think I was actually finished yet with my doctorate and I was teaching this course. Um, at the time, it was called Preparation for Individual Counseling. And IPR, which both of them have referred to, is actually what we're going to um, show you today and hopefully engage you in how you can use it in your work. 
Um, but what you should know is that I still use it today. So even though I'm no longer in the counseling psych program, I'm now in the organizational psychology program, um, we now use this method um, in a course for executive coaching. And it is the primary way that we teach um, executive coaches to coach. And Terry Mafia uses it in the um, Columbia Coaching Certification Program. And in the new executive master's program in change leadership that I direct, we also use it there. So even though it was from a long time ago, it's still quite current um, in the work that I do today and that we train our students in. So I am going to stand up for this part and hope it'll work with the videotape, um, just because I want to use a couple of slides to set the context. Um, so here's our plan. We're going to introduce to you um, interpersonal process recall, which we'll from now on call IPR. Um, and then there's a tool within that, which are four response modes. Then we're going to do a demonstration. Marcy and Carolyn have agreed to go live and be videotaped and then play it back. Um, and then um, we're going to talk to you about the implications for using it. Okay. Um, so you already have this cartoon in your packet, which you know is never good form because it kind of loses its impact, right? But um, the reason we like it is because you know this is what navigating interpersonal conversations looks like in 2012, right? GPS is a global positioning system that you use in cars all the time when you're driving to find out where you're going. But when you look at this cartoon, it really is about the internal dialogue, right? When you hear that voice come on in the car, it's like telling you what to do. Well, what IPR teaches you is to kind of tune into that internal voice that's going on in the conversation that sometimes you bring forward and sometimes you don't, right? So I always think like, you know, when I go differently than the GPS tells me, you know, and then usually she comes on and says, no, no, recalculate, recalculate, right? Just to tell you to go a different way. That's kind of what IPR helps you to do is kind of tune into what's going on under the surface. And what we thought is, um, we would just show you a, a quick videotape it's kind of a cultural marker. Um, so let me just ask you one question. How many of you remember the movie Annie Hall? So this is such a relief to me. <laughs> <laughs> when I teach, you can imagine, when I ask this question, students just look at me like, wow, are you old? <laughs> you know, what's Annie Hall? Right? But at the time, it was like a really cool movie in the, I guess, late 70s. Um, the reason we use that videotape is because the captions, right, are what IPR teaches you to tune into, right? Like when you're having a conversation with somebody, there's usually stuff going on in your mind that you don't say, right? So even the stuff about being Jewish, the cultural reference, even when he talks about how great looking she is, like we don't usually talk about that, right, in polite company. <laughs> but it is stuff that's going on in the room. So we think it kind of demonstrates what you need to do in order to, eat, in order to be more effective. And I'll, if you sort of just stay with us, we'll take you on this quick journey, right? So it gives you an opportunity to understand more about your own communication style. Um, it gives you some new um, tools to use. It helps you kind of make the conversation non-threatening, because really there's no way to get it wrong, because you're really just trying to understand what was going on between the two of you. So it's not like this method of training it's not like I'm going to watch the videotape and say, oh, you did that right, you did that wrong. I'm really just going to be interested in what's going on with them so that they can really learn more about what was happening in the conversation and their own styles. Um, it was developed a long time ago by um, Norman Hagen and his colleagues at Michigan State. So this is not the latest research on interpersonal conversations. It's really a tried and true method that was used um, to train counselors, um, but it was also used to, to train people um, who worked with people. So it was used with police, um, it was used with attorneys, it was used with mediators, actually I know we have somebody in the room. I mean it was used across professions, across sectors, because it was really just the idea that you had to be good at interpersonal skill in order to do your work. Um, and as a result, you know, what we hope is that you just develop much more self-awareness and much more awareness of the other person. And that instead of just um, doing it in the recall process that you'll see, you actually do it live, right? So that's really where we're headed. And as a way to get started, Marcy and Carolyn are gonna do a quick role play, right? This isn't the one that we're videotaping. 
Um, this is one where Marcy is going to be in the role of coach, and Caroline is going to be in the role of client. And Caroline is really preparing to ask her manager for a raise, right? So imagine the situation. Get yourself there. Marcy, I can't decide how to approach my boss for a raise. Well, you, you tell me he's a nice guy. Just go in there and ask him. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn, what impact did that have on you? Kind of just shut me down. I felt like I hadn't really been heard and uh, didn't really help. And Marcy, what was going on for you? She had told me he was a nice guy. I thought it was an obvious response. Can you imagine? Would any of you act like Marcy acted? Good. No? You could probably leave and go to another session. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people think all the right? time. I think if I understood correctly, right? That she was yeah. just telling her to do what she wants to do. Yeah, right? yeah. Like yeah. exactly. I would yeah. ask more questions. Uh, I would ask more questions. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's and great. To the yeah. So that's exactly like what we're going to say is that like you don't have to have that conversation, and, and your response is exactly the bridge, right? Because there are four response modes, and the first one that we would teach is exploratory which is really, I think, what you would do, right? So tell me more about the context for the conversation, right? It's nothing more than just engaging the other person as your partner, right? Like, even though they're coming to you for help, right, what really helps is to have it be egalitarian, to make sure that the other person feels like they have responsibility for this and you're just there to sort of be facilitative of their learning. So you really just ask open-ended questions. The next one is listening, which is exactly what it, it says. It's really just that you, as the coach, communicate a desire to want to know more, right? So it's more, you know, what you learned a long time ago, like paraphrasing. You know, the quote I have up here, um, I don't know if you can all see it. It says, it sounds like, this is what Marcy could have said to Caroline. It sounds like you have wanted to have this conversation for a long time, and your concern about possible political consequences has kept you from having it. Is that right? Now you have to imagine that there was some content from Caroline that pulled for that, right? But that she really talked about being afraid that her boss would say no, right? And so really worried about that. And so you, what you would want to do is just reflect back and kind of encourage Caroline to say more about really her ambivalence about talking to her boss. Um, the next one is affective. And this is where you really go more for the feeling. Right? And the idea is basically, you know, that the world of work is constructed as very rational, right? You're really supposed to check your emotions at the door. And, but yet our emotions influence what goes on in the conversation. And so if you can bring that into the conversation, you can probably have a fuller, richer discussion, and it really helps the learning, and it helps get to some action plan. And so what Marcy might have said if she heard more about Carolyn's feelings was, it sounds like you have mixed feelings about talking to your boss. On the one hand, you feel excited about asking for what you believe you deserve. And on the other hand, you're nervous that she will not agree with you. Right? So what you're trying to do is make the feelings explicit. And then finally, the fourth response is honest labeling. And this is just one of those direct you know, frank conversations where you kind of call it in the moment. You're incisive. Some of you are shaking your heads. Like, do you use this? Like, because sometimes people think you can't do that unless you have a relationship, unless you have hours. And I actually think you can use this pretty quickly because it, it really helps you get to the point and really make good use of your time, right? Like in this world, you have to do everything faster, cheaper yesterday, right? So being able to use honest labeling helps. And what it is is really, yes, but I just, I, I'm just thinking. Sure. That if she, if, if she had continued and said, "You said he's a nice person, so what's the, what is holding you back?" Would that have made a difference? Um, well, let's ask Carol. That would have been, uh, that would have been better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely better. So that would have, it would have started my conversation mm -hmm. instead of stopping it. Mm -hmm. So that would be both encouraging the client to say more. 
but also holding back is you really making an inference about what might be going on, right? But that's what she's, she told her, and you said he's a nice guy, so she's using what you said before, right? But extending it to say that you know what's the point, he said it's a little bit better. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. thank you. Um, I work with high school juniors and seniors, uh -huh. um, college counseling process and stuff like that, and they'll come in, and um, sometimes you'd love to be able to sit down and talk to them for 15 or 20 minutes, in reality is you have like a minute, yes. or a minute and a half, and, and so the honest labeling response is really interesting, but it also seems like a little more high risk, because you, you, you run the risk of potentially offending somebody, and you didn't mean to, but, but because it's sort of frank and short, sort of fast, um, is there a way that you can kind of even table something to say, hey, I, I don't know, like in, in a way that yeah, you're not right. necessarily worried about um, offending, but it's just more a question of time. Right. No, I think that's an excellent point. Because I think, I mean, I think that's when people say you do have to have the relationship, there does have to be some trust, right? And I think sometimes you can call the issue and say, we need to find another time to do it. Like, um, I had a student come in and you know, it was a class where attendance was mandatory and she wanted to miss like three classes and, and I, I was sort of saying no and she was sort of pressing her point and we weren't getting anywhere, we were like just stuck and then I finally said, well, you know, I, I'm curious, like what were you hoping I would say? And she said, well, I was hoping that you'd see that I was such a great student that, you know, it would be okay because I could make up the work and that you knew that I, you know, was really committed and I was like, oh, okay, so let's have that conversation. Right, and I see that as honest labeling by just sort of saying like, what were you hoping? And because that's not what's happening between us, like we're really stuck. Mm -hmm. um, that's not so high risk, yeah. right? I think if you said something like what's on the screen, right? Given our conversation, I find myself thinking that we need to address your ambivalence about claiming your value as it seems that you are more comfortable not asking for a raise and remaining frustrated with your boss not recognizing your contribution. Mm -hmm. That's pretty risky. Uh, so honest labeling might go later in a session if you had a longer session, maybe not the mm -hmm. first thing you would start with, or if you had a relationship with the student where you had met with them 10 or 15 times and you already knew them and you only had one minute, maybe you'd be able to come forward with an honest labeling, but probably wouldn't start maybe with that. Yeah. yeah. And so really these are just tools. Like we just wanted to say that like when we do this over time, right, we spend um, a, a few weeks teaching these tools, giving folks the opportunity to practice them before we leap into what we're going to do next. Under what circumstances is it better to make that as a statement rather than to ask it as a question, such as, what is it about not asking for a raise that makes you more comfortable than asking for a raise? When would you make it a statement and when a yeah. question? Well, I'd make it a question if I were really if I didn't have a hypothesis that I was trying to check out, right? Like if I was really wanted the data, like, like this sort of assumes that there was enough data in the room about her ambivalence. If I didn't know that, I would ask a question to kind of find out. Okay. Yeah, I've always gone on the premise not to ask a question that I already know the answer to. Mm -hmm. So that would support what you're saying, is that to turn it into a question if I really need to know the answer. Mm -hmm. Make it as a statement if it's something I want to produce is what I've observed from this from this exchange. And now I can tell you that it seems, persist, pers given our conversation, this. So I guess with a similar question, not a question, but a similar statement, but much shorter, is something like if um, you had said to her, it sounds like you don't want to ask. Yes. Much, much more incisive. <laughs> <and> <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. I be honest with you. But yeah. are you assuming that Marcy has a lot of background information or Carolyn in terms of how much is she now making, how many hours a week is she working, how much are people who are working the same amount of time making, how does the horse react to giving a raise? I mean, are we assuming that Marcy knows all that? Because if she doesn't, I would face those questions. Right, and really collect the data about that. But sometimes, even if she does know the answers to those questions, Getting me, giving me the tools to figure out what's right for me versus what she thinks is yeah, right sure, yes. is probably a better way to go. And then I have those tools and it helps me a lot more. Um, and it, the idea is that I'm, I know myself best. I'm the best person to be able to find my own solution. I just need a little bit of help digging for it. Mm -hmm. 
So what we're going to shift to is the um, actually show you the IPR method, right? So basically, it's a method where you um, have people have a conversation, you videotape it, you play it back. You have the two people who had the conversation have total control over the videotape. They stop it whenever there was anything that was going on for them at the time they didn't speak to, right? And um, there's an inquirer, so a third person sits down. That's going to be me. And my role is just to be curious. So this is where I'm not going to supervise them. I'm not going to give them feedback. I'm just going to be really interested in their experience. This is the role that is critical to improving interpersonal communication skills. It's by internalizing the inquirer that you're really able to be more effective, because then you do it live, right? Um, and so I'm going to, you'll, you'll see it. It's probably better if I don't talk so much about it and we just move on. Um, so what we're going to do now is move to Marcy and Caroline having a conversation. And this time, it's real. So the last time, that was a role play. Caroline is not really asking her boss for a raise. This time, the setup is, is that Caroline was just asked to bring something real to the conversation. Marcy does not know what it is she's going to bring. And Marcy's job is to just be helpful. Right? We're going to do this for five minutes. So in September, I became uh, an MD master, as they call it. And at first, I liked it. And now I'm not liking it very much. I'm not doing this. Tell me what you're not liking about it. I'm curious. Um, well, just as an example, uh, at first, I kind of felt like I have all this food time to myself. Sure, I miss the kids, but it was okay. And now I feel like I'm kind of dealing with all their difficulties and not necessarily having all the great things of when they were living at home. And uh, like my son had gone, and he was calling me and calling the doctor. And, you know, it's just, um, it's getting harder. It's it sounds to me like some of the freedom that you felt in September, you're not feeling anymore. But they're becoming dependent on you again. It's really true. <laughs> it's true. It's uh, when they have big issues to deal with, then they seem to turn to me for my assistance. Um, and I don't mind that. It's just uh, they're far away, and it's, uh, it's, it's a lot more difficult than when they were right there. And, and it's not. It, it, yeah, I mean, it sounds to me, I don't know your kids, but it's meant, I, what I'm imagining is that they still want your input, but you don't get to see the good part. Right. You're only getting the bad part. Exactly. And they're not always sharing the good part. Not bad. <laughs> they only call me when it's bad stuff yeah. and they need my help. Yeah. And then I have to kind of worry long distance. My son ended up in the ER last week, Sunday, and, uh, you know, sitting there, you know, right. and I said, do you want me to come? And he said, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> so I'm long distance worrying, and um, it's, it's, it's harder. And I thought it was going to only get easier. Well, I'm wondering if that role, if your kids are still wanting to depend on you at certain times, if that role is going to maintain itself for a while, or if you want to start to undo that a little. But if it's going to maintain itself for a while, do you want to go back and recognize what was September like and what could you regain? Mm -hmm. Maybe things Granted, their freedom was new in September. Maybe not both of them simultaneously, but you get to college, September's a blast. Um, so they didn't need you as much, or they didn't want to need you as much. So I don't know if you can assert some of the things you had back then into your relationships with them now and into your own life. That's a good idea. So maybe talking to them and telling them, you know, either you don't need to call for every incident. between texting and um, emailing and cell phones, what used to be for you and me a time of life where we left their parents behind and started to fight our own battles. Kids are now keeping their parents involved in their battles, and parents who thought they were going to get a little freedom aren't getting what they hoped for. So I guess it's up to me to kind of cut the cord a little bit and, and let them deal with 
I mean, when he was in the ER, you weren't going to... That, that, yeah. that. But are there some where you other quit? things, yeah, for smaller things. That think that a very, a very big way to go. Can you even imagine doing that? I don't know. I can't. I can't. I guess, you know, maybe part of me still wants to be important in their lives, too. Mm -hmm. So maybe I haven't been as good at cutting that cord, mm -hmm. but... Um, Marcy and Carolyn, thank you for your interaction. We're going to play it back now, and I want you to, you know, sometimes your mind works much faster than what actually comes out of your mouth in a conversation, and there may have been things you were thinking, feeling, expectations you had of each other, something you wanted, um, but you, there really wasn't time to t speak to that, right? Or for some reason you may not have spoken to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to play back your interaction, and I want you to just let um, let Joel know whenever it is you want to stop the tape, right? And my role is as inquirer, and what I'm going to do is just ask you um, open-ended questions because I'm just really curious about your experience, right? So I'm not going to stop the tape. It's really up to you. that Marcy was feeling like she was way out on a limb? Yeah. 
for long distance. So I ended up in the ER last week, Sunday, and uh, you know, sitting there, and you want me to come and sit down, and I was like, hey. <laughs> so I'm long distance worrying, and um, it's, it's hard. And how does it want to get through? Well, I'm wondering if that will, the kids are still wanting to depend on kids certain times, if that will sort of maintain itself for a while, or if you want to start to undo that a little. But it's all that would be a very good motivation for relationship for me that uh, all of a sudden it was in my power kind of to make a change here as opposed to waiting for the kids to cut the cord and to stop calling, to stop, you know, to deal with their own issues. And all of a sudden it kind of turned around for me. So that was really useful. Um, what we when you said that. Were you aware of that, Marcy? Um, no, once again, I'm relieved to hear it because I thought that I, I wanted to make a point that I understood. It sounded like her kids are still at a stage where those big needs are going to continue and they're going to sustain them. And, and, and asking her, suggesting to her that she cut back on that might not be where she is with her kids. I don't know. So I was, I was a little anxious asking that. Mm -hmm. I was. Was there anything that you wanted from her at that point when you asked it? Um, no, I just wanted, well, I probably would have wanted reassurance that I hadn't gone too mm -hmm. far in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she did. I did hear that, that. Mm -hmm. in her response. Yeah. And maybe what I needed from her also was the permission to cut the cord a little bit. And mm -hmm. hearing that was something. Were you thinking that at the time? Do you remember? At, you mean after she said that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, well, thinking it now in the recall, I don't know that I was thinking it exactly. I think we also already, the, the words you used up there, we heard was cut the cord, and I I felt bad that she was already going to cut the cord, mm -hmm. going to that place. Mm -hmm. um, because what I was trying to suggest was pulling back, and cutting means cutting. And I was meaning step back. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought, oh, did I take it too far? I was a little worried about that. So what kind of feelings were going on for you? Me, yeah. I was anxious. Yeah, I was anxious. Were either of you aware of the setting and the people in the room and doing this? No. <laughs> Do you remember what kind of impact it had? I was trying to let it go. I was more spending spending energy saving myself, ignore, let that go, focus on Caroline. And I did feel very focused as as time went on. I just felt like it was just the two of us. Yeah, I did too. Actually, it got easier. That's true. Okay. Maintain yourself for a while. Do you want to go back and recognize what was September like and what could be the game? We did things. Granted, their freedom was new in September. Maybe not both of them simultaneously, but you get to college and others were last. Um, so they didn't need you as much, they didn't want to need you as much. So I don't know if you can assert some of the freedom you got back then into your relationships with them now into your own life. That's a good idea. So maybe talking to them, telling them, you know, either don't eat the well, That The phrase that I, when I said to her, um, maybe you don't, uh, they don't, they won't need you as much, or you won't, they won't want to need you as much. And I corrected myself. And I'll, I felt good that I corrected myself because I felt that was the way for all the things I just said about that I felt that I was going too fast uh -huh. to recognize that the kids are still going to need them. If I said they won't need you as much, that's a little too far. So I went back to the man, I want to need you. You don't want them to need you as much. Mm -hmm. um, and I, when, I, when I said that, I thought, yeah, that's the case I want to move at. Mm -hmm. And I was glad I was able to do that. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, were you aware that that's what Marcy was doing? Um, no, not at the not at the time. I guess um, I don't really have the fear that they're not going to need me. I didn't have that same feeling of like I'm going to cut the cord and I'm not going to speak to them and we're very close. And so that's not an issue. If anything's an issue for me, it's that we are very close and I'm very involved in their lives. So um, not as much of that was going on for me as we thought. Anything else at this point? Incident 
or also maybe found the problem. I've heard this from other farms as well. The way technology is now between texting and um, emailing and cell phones, what used to be for you and me at Tom McGloy when we left our parents behind and started to fight our own battles, kids are now keeping their parents involved in their battles, and parents who thought they were going to get a little freedom aren't getting what they hoped for. So I guess it's up to me to kind of cut the cord a little bit and let them get some of their own issues. Is that what you think? I mean, we're using the ER. Are you going to have to do that? 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 Can you even imagine doing that? I can. I can. I guess, you know, maybe part of these still wants to be important in their lives, too. So maybe I haven't been as good at cutting that cord, but um, I've seen that it's it's probably good for them and good for me. Yeah. It's clear from what you're telling me, you're still kind of important in their lives. Um, but what, what I would imagine is that if you start to have some other important things in your life, you're going to think that kind of importance won't be as serious. That was where I was going to be honest labeling. Yeah. I really want to know from Caroline how that felt to her. That was right on. What, what did you imagine? Like, what did you think was going on I with Carolyn? I thought we were ready for it. I felt, that felt, felt less out on a limb when I said that than I did earlier in the conversation. But nonetheless, I didn't want to diminish from her whatever things are important in her life around her kids and the lack of other important things. I didn't want to assume that. Did you have some imagined outcome? I was a little worried she might have said to me, where am I going to find other important things? I really need important things. My kids are my important things. Uh -huh. And I didn't, want to, I didn't want to assume that she didn't have other important things to do. But I nonetheless thought it was an appropriate uh, observation okay. and suggestion. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Hey, that's a very good point. And probably if I weren't as available to other things going on in my life, more so. Um, his nails to make it for me. I try to get in touch with me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So at the end here, is there, and um, when you think back on the whole session, what is your learning from the recall? In this isolated experience, uh, I learned that uh, the problem that Caroline presented, she was ready to confront, mm -hmm. and she was therefore needed to talk to her about it. It would have, I also think, it would have gone very differently if somebody were less ready to confront the issue. Mm -hmm. The way he responded to me made me think she she really wants to do something about this. She's just not, you know, shooting the breeze. So, you know, I just I think it would have gone very differently if somebody had been less ready. But also, from Marcy, I was getting, really feeling understood, as I said, between the way she was looking at me, the way she was saying, even that, you know, friends had the same kinds of issues. I felt completely understood, so it was safe to hear the suggestions as well. It was, it, I was at a point, you brought it to the point where I was ready to hear that, so um, the timing. Great. Thank you both very much. Joel, can you just bring back up the slides? Sure. So what we'd like to do is open it up for your observations, either about the initial conversation, the recall, the juxtaposition, um, or anything that's on your mind. We'll start with you. And Marcy and John are available for questions as well. I have a question, point of clarification. Sure. I wasn't sure whether Marcy was playing the role of a professional counselor or therapist or whether she was playing the role 
of a good friend and confidant who had a lot of insights. I was, it, in my mind and in reality, it's the latter. But that was sort of my point early in our discussion when I said I've tended to use these methods um, in most, in many relationships with my, in my life when people bring to me situations which, you know, some people do, some people don't. Some friends do, some friends don't. Um, but I was just, if, as if she and I were having a cup of coffee and she said, she had exposed that to me, I would have liked the conversation to go that way. So it wasn't as if she came to you for professional help? It was not on my mind, no. That's the thing with IPR is there's so many different areas that you can use it. You can use it as a, with a friend. You can use it a teacher speaking to a student. You can use it if you know you're in the workplace and you're talking to a colleague. There there are so many different areas that it can help you, and it just helps the interpersonal relationship. So it's not always a client and a counselor or a coach speaking. So, Marcy, if it had not been somebody who was your classmate who you'd known for yes. many years and felt that kind of friendship and intimacy, would you have been more uh, cautious about using statements like cut the cord and being uh, less directive than you were Well, I don't think I said cut the cord first. I think she said it first, and I would not, I would not have used That was not on my mind that she cut the cord. Once, but once she said it, I'm not sure if I echoed it at all, but um, I felt it was fair gay. Because she had introduced Yes. Yeah. yeah. And oh, so getting back to the, the gist of your question, um, as I mentioned before, I work with, with faculty and I lead and um, direct faculty, and I can definitely imagine having a conversation that went just like that, yes, on something professional. Yeah. And I feel like that speaks to your question earlier, right? The gentleman in the back of the room, oh. right? A about sort of the timing and when to use it and how to use it if you don't have a deep relationship. So I think uh, just thinking about the timing and context does really matter. Yeah. I was going to ask, there was one point here um, where your voice trailed a little bit and you became a little bit maybe more introspective mm -hmm. in the conversation. And I noticed that you went from there to more action oriented statements. And I, in the recall, what I seemed to hmm. observe was that you were really saying that you were very ready for action. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't necessarily sensing that, but I know in the session, the, the diet has its own dynamic. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could talk about mm. that. I mean, I think there were times where I was digesting Marcy saying back what I was saying, and I was thinking about it, and and um, some of the ideas also that you know, with things the way they are, and um, today with communication that we're much more in touch with our children and all. So I was kind of processing that at the same time and then um, but I felt very ready also for what Marcy was bringing in it just all seemed to tie together for me other observations yes. I have a question about sort of thinking about it in a more therapeutic context because a lot of what we're trying to get at here is that we need to have insight about what, what I'm expecting, what the other person might be expecting, but sometimes, even if I know what the other person expects, is expecting me to say, that's not necessarily the best thing to say. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay, let's say the other person's like really pulling for me to give advice, but in like I said, I'm pretty excited that I have So I was wondering if it's a big So I think how it's helpful is that you can speak to that. Right? And in a therapeutic setting, you can say, you know, I feel like what you really want from me is advice. And I find myself not wanting to give you advice because it would be my advice and not really come from you. And so I'm wondering what we could talk about that would help you get to your own answer about this. Right? Something like that. Where you make explicit the want. Right? Because I think if you don't, then you're getting, I mean, when I'm in that role, I get preoccupied. Like, this person wants advice. Am I going to give advice? You know? And then I'm in my own head and I'm not listening to the other person. So when I make it explicit, it sort of frees up the communication. to um, high school children or elementary school children and they're hmm. solving that problem solving. Problem solving. Conflict resolution and problem mm -hmm. solving. Mm -hmm. I think it would be great. I think it would be fantastic if you could bring it to a, in, in a way and in a level that they could understand it. They're, they're tools. They're tools for inter, interpersonal communication and understand and, and really ultimately listening. My role, I had to listen. 
it has been used in a college setting before. Co college yeah. where yeah. more I, students would. I, I teach um, in the in the junior college, and I tell my students all the time that this is an object to be children and that we should not hold back on them. And I think as I, as we're doing this, I'm looking at them. But children also can help each other to solve problems. So I see this also as a model that we could introduce for young students, you know, to yeah. generation to come to Also, I wanted to throw something out to you. I was just, uh, something that happened that I, uh, as I looked at as I'm reflecting on a problem, because a friend of mine lost her job, and she called me, and I'm trying to comfort her. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I said the wrong thing. So I said to her, when I was in a similar situation, I thought I was devastating, but then it turned out to be one of the best things that happened to me. And she said, I want to talk to you. <laughs> and my sister here said to me, no, you really did say the wrong thing. <laughs> right. So what she wanted to hear, that's not what she needed to hear at that point. Right. So I think what I'm, I'm going to go to. Well, I think what IPR can do is help you have that conversation about like why you thought it was the wrong thing. You know that your that wasn't your intention, right? That our intentions are sometimes different than the effects that they have. I was saying to her that when it happens to me, it turned out to be a wonderful thing because better things happen. Sure. She didn't see that light. She saw I am in a situation and I need to comfort. I think that was nice. Right. So that's the timing piece, right? So and saying, then Marion, and then I'll come back to you. Yeah, because my granddaughter was a mediator in middle school, and some of what this is bringing back to me is the kind of thing, you know, they were dealing with bullying, and they were dealing with this, that, and that, and so they were training these kids to, to do some of this, obviously, you know, at their level. So sure. It, it certainly... Well, can I'm really teach glad to hear empathy it. to a certain degree because you're trying to figure out what is the other person feeling and, and put words to it. And as you said, children or someone who's being bullied doesn't, or someone who's doing the bullying isn't necessarily thinking about what the other person is feeling when you're doing that. So that's a really interesting way to use it. It's happening. Yeah, right. And I think what it does is it brings out what's going on under the surface. Right? And I think if you can make that explicit, then you can really talk about that. Like, what are you trying to do by doing this? Right? That's eventually where it goes. So I know you had your hand up, and then I'll come over here. One, two, three. Okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. Two things. Uh, uh, first, don't you think that adults, when they relate their stories or problems to other adults, don't you think that they like to hear the adults say what you want to hear? We are a This is Always. a question. Uh, it, might be, it might not address the problem and just make them feel comfortable. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to add, uh, my son goes to school in Queen's and the intermediate high school and we teach them peer mediator mm -hmm. and it really worked really, really well because my, my son has that in front of me with his uh, friends and I was really uh, happy to see that. Right. They give, they give the kids self-confidence to be in a situation to involve them and try to help other people's problems. Maybe they go to the same school? No. <laughs> Is it those Armstrong? No. <laughs> See, I think that's true. Let me just speak to your first point. I, I mean, so I do think that we often like go to talk to somebody, we just want to hear what we want to hear. But I guess what I think this method does is allow you to be a more effective communicator, right? Like, because you could go to anybody and hear what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. But if you want to go to somebody who you're hoping will actually help you, right, and, and help broadly defined, Right? Then having somebody who has these skills that can get to kind of what's not being spoken, I think is usually more facilitative and helps you navigate a better conversation to hopefully a more effective outcome. I mean, that's how I see it as different. Um, my question is, as the IPR method can apply in a session with more than two individuals, and is it recommended, and how different the results be in terms of that one person so like in a group, is that what you're suggesting? Right. You know, it's funny, I used to teach group dynamics at the same time I was teaching this, and so we did try doing a recall of a group session. It's a little more, it's, it's more challenging. Um, it does help bring out the covert. So yes, you can use it. It's, I think it was initially designed for one-on-one. -on -one. But if your intention is to help the group become more aware, about what's going on on the surface versus under the surface, yes, it can help. 
and then put your hand up and then we'll go. Sure. Um, it all seems great, but I worry like in a conversation that I'm going to be like thinking, oh wait, now I've got to about this, so, uh, and, and I'm going to lose sight of like the actual person in front of me, so sure. in my head thinking about sort of what are the sort of steps or, you know, I watched the two of you and it seems very effortless because you seem to be very well sort of versed in it, and, but it seems a little daunting. Um, when you're not well versed. So how do you sort of encourage people who are beginning with IPR? Don't forget that this is a, just a one hour session. Sure. Usually this is done in a class. And for example, when Marcy and I took the class, we practiced these you know, listening and exploratory responses. And eventually it becomes much more natural, but it does take some practice, and we made lists of different kinds of responses, and you'll see in your handout there are different scenarios, and we came up with answers, and the more you practice it when you're not in a session, the more it becomes kind of second nature to you, and then you're ready to use it where you're not sitting there saying like, oh, I better get, come up with an exploratory response at this point. But it's to, the practicing helps make it second nature, I would say. Yeah, I would concur with that. I will say that, to remind myself in preparation for today, I think it's in your, in your, in your packet, examples of situations, asking for different types of responses. And I actually spent some time going through those myself in the past few days mm -hmm. to remind myself of those methods. But then I told Deborah and Caroline this afternoon that I was just going to let it go and stop thinking about the titled responses and have a conversation with Caroline. Right. So it is, it's a matter of internalizing, you know, and that just comes with practice. Like well, anything else. Right. And let me say that I do think it's the inquirer role. Like, I, you know, I, I wondered if you had any observations about that, and I know we have time for just like a couple of last questions, right? Um, that, you know, it's this role, right, of really asking those open-ended questions. That's how it gets internalized. Like, that's how it becomes part of you. So in the class, like, you get a lot, we have labs where you practice this over and over. So a student does the role that I was doing, if that helps. Any last, yeah? I was going to ask what the research what this method is showing in terms of differences in uh, gender response using this approach. And, uh, and also whether it was just used in cross cultural situations mm -hmm. and what expectations, approaches, expectations were, might have been different um, in, in those settings. Yeah, I can speak to the cross cultural. I can tell you that. Very long time ago, I wanted to do my dissertation on this. I was going to do it in a hospital setting with doctors and patients because I was convinced, you know, that there was lots that was unspoken. That if it was spoken between them, would really lead to much better outcomes in terms of that. And went through the IRB eight times and never got approved. So it tells you about the state of medicine 25 years ago. Um, but in terms of cross-cultural, like one of the issues is, is that when you do it in cultures in which it's not polite to talk about the explicit. Right, you really have to do a lot of work to set it up and make it safe and culturally appropriate. Right, so um, in Asia, you know, when when I tried to do this, like what they said was, wait, like that's not how we do it. Right, and so you have to really sort of shift what the standard is and what you're trying to do, and and I think eventually they get there and they find it really useful because they get that that's what's going on, but it's not kind of a, of course, let's go do it. Right, like I don't think this conversation would have happened, right, in a, in a country in which those are not the norms around interpersonal communication. But also there are lots of different things that could go on depending on who we were and maybe if there had been uh, different cultures who were speaking to each other, that probably would have come up in the recall and that is the kind of thing that we would have reflected on. It didn't happen with us, and, and also sometimes what happens is you say, well, that response was not helpful to me at all, and then you learn from that as well. So the role of inquirer culturally, they might, that might come up if you have two cultures, um, one counseling the other as well, and that's a good thing to bring up in, in a session. Yeah, I'm sorry. We're, we're we're out of time. So we'll be here if you want to come up. And, um, but we really appreciate your engagement very much. Thanks for coming. Thank